of the devotee. So this attachment to the particular form corresponds, awakens in asakti, and the specific taste of ruchi is still there, attachment to, to bhakti is still there. And there's a correspondence, obviously, between the object of love and the, and the one who's perceiving the object of love or doing, doing the loving. So there's some, that's why we say there's some, some glimpse, some sensibility of Bhakti Manu Thakur then, for example, I said this is, this is a, a stage in which one can really effectively engage in uh, contemplation of one's sarup. Prior to Asakti, he, he, he says it can be troublesome. Hmm? Um, so it arises naturally and, and, and so forth. So attachment to the object is, is, is from a particular perspective. So, but in Bhava Bhakti, then the, the, the sprout is there. I gave the example of roots going down and something coming out of the seed, but not yet popping above the ground. So in Bhava Bhakti, it's the, the sprout. It appears, and um, what might have been understood theoretically, and then is is now the vantage point from which there's an ongoing culture of Lila Seva in Bhava Bhakti. So, so um, all that said. It's all kind of underneath the ground, if you will, and internal, and and there are at the same time external symptoms of the sprout of bhava, and these are very useful to us. Um, I've said before that the observable characteristics are useful uh, in determining the guru. Shabde Parajanishnatam Brahmani Upasham Ashrayam, for example. Um, it's very practical because, as I've said, we could say whatever. He's dancing with the gopis, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, you can't necessarily see that. And maybe it's your subjective you know, conclusion or guess or way of projecting and so forth, but for the from an objective point of view, those the, the, the qualities that we could look to as indicators that is very valuable. So Rupa Goswami has, has given these. Hmm. And even there are some other external symptoms like tears for repletion and the sati kababas, which are very extraordinary. Um, but as we hear as we go on in this chapter, they may appear in someone who doesn't have bhava. A shadow of them may appear. They may appear, but they're what they're about is different because they come from a different orientation. Hmm? So it's not it's not rati or bhava or bhakti, but the symptoms come. Hmm? So they may have them and not have bhava. They may not show them, hmm? especially in the early stages when they can be covered, so to speak. Just like, and the purpose behind that, you might wonder, it is. That if you have a light, if you have a candle, or then then you might want to. Sometimes we put a candle in a glass, so that it's protected from the wind. When we're out at Sarvrai and and the wind is trying to start a fire, then we want to fan it. It's the same idea. Get the spark. Protect the spark. Bring some dry wood, you know, some smaller wood, you know, throw some pine on there, sh- sh- and so forth. So, so this is this this flame hmm, of love of God in in the form of this the sprout of Baba. It needs to be protected. Hmm? Hmm. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's 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 internal. So he may. It's thought that by flashing it around everywhere, it might go out. Check my flame out. 
<laughs> oh, sorry. Let me know. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, because it's just beginning and it's, it's, it's culture is it's at the early stages and so forth. Hmm? And so Naruto, for example, tells uh, in his, in his um, songs that, that, that one should not share one's bhava with others. Hmm? Uh, there may be, of course, higher stage where this is, happens. We find that in the writing of Bhakti Vinod, he did something like that um, about himself. These are ex exceptional exceptions to the rule, but the, the principle I'm speaking about here is, is understandable. Hmm? Just coming, well, take care of that. Not everybody will understand, and hmm? and so there's a there's a there's an internal reason for covering the symptoms. And of course there's there's no at this stage there's no external reason for wanting to flaunt them because before Baba there might be or before Ruji there might be their material desires. So some 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 semblance of Baba, a shadow of Baba may come and and some Bhakti Vinod writes one wants to show in Christ during the lecture. And that People become attracted and so forth. Hmm? Uh, so this is not. Uh, this is to be become distracted oneself from the, the role and the and the nature of the course and the culture. Hmm? Also, of course, uh, you 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 want persons to get involved for the right reasons. Hmm? You don't want warm bodies only around. So you can do all kinds of things to get people to come and get involved for the for the wrong reasons. That'll only come to haunt you in the in the in the long run. <laughs> so better to have persons come on the basis of the teaching. When I first by force of circumstance, had to start my own mission, Arshita Jaitanya Sangha, I thought, well, let me just write something, make a literary contribution. I was fond of distributing Prabhupada's books, but at that time we weren't allowed to get Prabhupada's books for distribution. So I thought, well, we've got to write some books then. I had only written a letter, you know, by that time, a few of those. Um, but, um, I began, and so I felt we had to have some books, articles, and, and, and so on. And I thought, let us develop a reading congregation. Hmm. Keep people at a little distance, <laughs> but let them read and identify with the teaching and so forth. And if on the basis of the philosophy, they can come in close, it's a little, then you've got somebody who's coming in, and you're on the same page. Hmm. They're interested based on the philosophy. So, um, Prabhupada was fond of uh, making the point that he had, what, 60 books or 30 books, whatever he used to say, 60 books we have, and so forth. And, and that, uh, that Bhakti, although a sentiment, it had a underlying foundation of knowledge. As I've said, the aesthetic of Bhakti, the art of bhakti appears on the canvas of philosophy. That philosophy is the Chintya Veda Veda, a particular metaphysic of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, of the Goswamis. <clears throat> so, um, so for, it's very practical mm -hmm. that uh, if, if you, if you want to show some miracles or ecstasy or something like that, people will come. Whatever you're saying, it doesn't matter. And I see it now too. I, I was reading someone was saying, how, "Hey, in Bengal, there's all there's bowls, and they got a bad name. They're actually pretty neat. They do these magical things, and there's this one, this type, and that." And I'm thinking, "Yeah, there's all kinds of things out there. You can go to the circus too." Uh, <laughs> what about the philosophy? What about the? I mean, that's the ground that Vrindavan arises out of. Pujapachita Marsh gave the example, and I've cited it before myself. I think it's a beautiful one that that the uh, United States of America has the biggest and most powerful military-industrial complex, but you do not see tanks and missiles 
and machine guns everywhere because if they were marching on the streets like that, I guess they're starting to do that now, it, it intimidates people. Hmm? And the peaceful um, intercourse between social intercourse is, is somewhat inhibited by the kind of machine gun over there. So that's all kept in the background, underneath the ground and so forth. Um, but should the country become attacked, then it all comes out, it's all there. Hmm? So Vrindavan, he said, is like this. All that knowledge, the opulence, the Aishvarya of knowledge, it's all present in Vrindavan. It's in the ground of Vrindavan. Hmm? When, when, when Bhakti Saddam Sashtataka heard from one of his missionaries, early missionaries, that they have some questions in Europe that we cannot answer, he replied, from the dust, particle of dust from the feet of Gorkashor Das Babaji Maharaj, all questions. All, all, can, it can drown all the knowledge of the world. It can extinguish, you know, override, whatever. It's more powerful. This was his um, idea. So the dust there is Chintamani Dham, Shidamarsh compared to our gurus are in the dust, in the, in the grains of sand on the banks of the Jumri, in Ramanreti. Prabhupada put his temple there, Ramanreti, in the, what is it? the pleasure sands of it's the name of the area. It's an area, incidentally, where Krishna Balaram would play along the banks of the Jumri, you know, their friends. Prabhupada happened, just happened to get, <laughs> get some land donated there and build a Krishna Balaram temple. Hmm. So, <laughs> so the, the point is that in Vrindavan, hmm, all knowledge is there. All the knowledge of the, any jnani, yogi, any um, aishvarya of the uh, uh, knowledge of, of Krishna's godhood, and so forth, you might find it by Kundur, Dwarka, Mathura. Uh, but it's, it's characterized as Gyanchunya, where a land where the Knowledge is is, is um, absent. Gyan Shunya Bhakti Bhakti with absence because it, because it it's stored away so to speak because it gets in the way to know that Krishna's God for example gets in the way of the exchange of intimacy in love between the Brajabasis the residents there and and Krishna but when those for example, handmaidens of Radha, young 13, 12 year old girls of the Braj come to this world in their sadhaka days as Rup Sanatan Jiva Goswami. And in this world, there's a need for knowledge. Then we see an extraordinary measure of knowledge uh, manifest. Hmm? Nana Shastra Vichara Naikunipano Sat Dharma Sam Stapako Lokanum Hitakarano Tibunemanyo Shamanyoka and compassion. Hmm? So they took from all the revealed scriptures and compiled <coughs> what we, we refer to now as the Bhakti Shastras. Hmm? And they, they, they built the foundation of the Chaitanya Sampradaya. So those girls are pretty smart up there, <laughs> they're pretty learned. Hmm? And uh, young boys and village people and and so forth, but the, but the knowledge is suppressed there. Hmm? Bhakti is so powerful that the knowledge is suppressed, and therefore there's a possibility of of intimacy. Hmm? So so at any rate, um, we we want people to come and be involved, if you will be on the same page with us, stand on the same ground. Hmm. Yeah, the art and the beauty, the aesthetic, the, the, uh, the, the rasa, the emotions, they're going to arise out of a ground of Advaigyan Tattva. Hmm. Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur used to say that bhajan is performed on the ground of Advaigyan Tattva. So Advaigyan Tattva is another way, if you will, it's a term from the Bhagavatam, another way of saying the ground here is a Chinti Beta Beta. Hmm? And on that ground, when we're standing on that ground, then real bhajan can be performed. 
Mm. Your practice will be well informed. Mm. So, rather than, and you know, they're out there. You have this Sai Babas and stuff, you know, vomiting up, you know, pieces of gold and stuff. And people are like mad after that. And I mean, Prabhupada used to say, you know, if you can, if you can manifest a piece of gold, one out of a whole mountain of gold, then it's solve all the economic problems. Mm -hmm. Right? If you're God, hmm, why only a nugget? <laughs> why only a, you know, a watch or whatever they do, you know, a, a golden egg, you know. Hmm. Uh, if you can manifest gold, then solve all the problems. And, and then you're going out asking for donations to feed the hungry people. Hmm? A lot of these swamis are engaged in such, such philanthropic activities and so forth, good as they are under themselves. But if you're God, why are you going to have to ask other people? You can manifest gold. Why not you know, go to reach into Fort Knox with your property city, extend their subtle arm over there, pull out a couple of bricks <laughs> every day? And, uh, you know, there's no taxes on that stuff. <laughs> So these displays are uh, made little of hmm? by the Goswamis and the Acharyas in our line, and the emphasis is on the teaching. There's so many books. Look at this book, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, about ecstasy. So he wants to show a little ecstasy or something, and people may swoon at that, and that could be imitated for that matter. Hmm? Where's his book? Yeah. What the, the, the book that Rupa Goswami's written about? The nature of ecstasy. You might think he knows something, something about it. Hmm? Um, and of course, it's all about really the ecstasy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, hmm? the likes of which, which actually was manifest because it just couldn't be contained. Hmm? Uh, the likes of which we don't find anywhere in the religious or in the secular world. So, if you're interested in ecstasy, as I said, we did that magazine. Ecstasy was one of the Titles when we first published the Clarion Call was our most popular one. So <laughs> we have a picture of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu there in Rathi Yatra. So um, here, at any rate, uh, the point is that uh, that there are some observable, reliable symptoms that we can look for, and um, they will be real indicators of Baba, whether or not there is fainting and passing out, and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we can go into them um, <coughs> a little bit tonight. It's such a useful way in which he's approached this, this topic. So, he says, Chantir avyartha kalatvam viraktir manasunyata ashabandha samutkanta namagane sadaruchi so these are the jata bhavam gur, gure jana. This is, this is for the people, the jana who have the, uh, the jata bhavam gur, in whom the, the, the sprout of bhav has taken birth. They will exhibit these qualities. They are. I'll read them out for you. He described them as anubhavas or characteristics, external characteristics of a person who has developed the bud of bhava are as follows. Remember that the thai bhava has a bud and then it has the flower. The flower bearing fruit, it's rasa. The thai bhava is called rasa. The thai bhava is called, called bhava. It's, it's a stage of bhava in the budding stage. And when it combines with the other ecstatic ingredients, they merge together, it becomes rasa. Hmm? So technically speaking, there is a difference between sakya bhav and sakya rasa. Hmm? Although sometimes they're used interchangeably. The anubhavas, or characteristics of a person who has developed the bud of bhava, are as follows. Tolerance, not wasting time 
detachment from enjoyment, pridelessness, confidence in the Lord's mercy, longing for the Lord, taste for chanting the names of the Lord. Attachment to discussing about Krishna's qualities and attachment to living in the abode of Krishna. Hmm. So he'll go through these. Some of them he'll give examples for. Hmm. Um, but overall, they, they are somewhat, as I say, uh, observable, and this is very, very practical. And this is when we, when we can, how we can apply the, the, uh, the term that Prabhupada used to like to use to describe bhakti as, as, a, as a, it's a science. So it means there's a system to it. Hmm? And so in science, you want objective data from which the, you, that you can observe in a closed environment and then make a conclusion. This happens repeatedly and then so we have a conclusion. Something like that. So here's observable data. We say as our uh, saint is, 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 is a bhava, bhakta, and this means that he or she is liberated and because Baba is a stage of liberation, but Prem has not yet developed, so there's a reason for still, for a culture, mm. continuing ongoing culture. So, how do we know? You know, somebody wrote a book, Conversation with God, it was popular, it was three or four volumes. Mm. So, and then somebody else said, I had one too, and you know, said, your book is bad, and, <laughs> <laughs> and so on, so, so, we here are we have an observable criteria. There's other criteria I've mentioned before in relation to the guru, it applies to all devotees, but it's very again, this is it's worth emphasizing, a very practical point. You can bring this to the public, it's kind of a science. We see these observable characteristics, they're hard to imitate. Hmm. They are indicators of something going on inside that's invisible and subjective. It's talked about, but we can't see it. Hmm? We can see it as we grow in ourselves and, and, and enter into that in, in a world. Hmm? But point being here is our faith is not blind, it's a seeing type of faith. Mm -hmm. hmm? We do have, we do have a, a science, if you will, a system. Hmm? So it's important to know it, to understand it. So here, the first of these qualities Tatra chantir chova hetav api prapte chantir ashubi tatmata. Tolerance, he says, basically, is defined as follows. Tolerance means being undisturbed even when there is a cause for disturbance. Now, this is in relation to the person, to the individual. We could see that Hanuman became disturbed, became angry on behalf of Ram, lit Lanka on fire, and so forth. That's another thing. So he may be disturbed for the, for the cause of the Lord, for the, in the service of the Vaishnav, and so forth. And of course, it's the Guru's business to be disturbed, so it's a little confusing. Uh, but <laughs> that's another thing. So. He gives an example. He says, Pitta, Pratame. Hmm? So, Pratame, in the first canto of the Bhagavatam, it is said, <coughs> Tan mopaya tam pratiyantu vipra ganga te devi dhuta chitta mishe dhuy jo pasrishta kuhakas takshako va dashtvaram gayata vishnugatha. First candle of the Bible to me says tolerance of a Bible box is illustrated as follows. Parikshit Maharaj, the great Raj, speaks. O Brahmins, just accept me as completely surrendered soul. Let Mother Ganges, representative of the Lord, also accept me in that way, for I have already taken the lotus feet of the Lord into my heart. Let the snake bird or whatever magical thing the Brahmin created bite me at once. I only desire that you will continue singing the deeds of Vishnu. So this comes in, in 
right near the end of the first canto of the Bhagavatam, the 19th chapter, first canto, 19th chapter, 15th verse. Pritchett Marsh, of course, is, is a big subject in the first canto. The first canto begins with the three verses, the invocation, seed of the, of the book, and uh, then the, the, the sages inquire from uh, uh, headed by Sonika of, of Sutta Goswami. They ask certain questions in the first chapter. The questions are answered in the second and the third chapter and the fourth chapter. Then the narrative begins of how the Bhagavatam that Sutta Goswami heard from Sukadev, because he was in this assembly where Sukadev spoke to the Raj, that's just about to happen with this verse. Mm -hmm. The Raj has sat down on the bank of the God, he's been cursed to die, and so forth, so Sukadev will come. So Sutta was also there in the assembly, and he mentions this to the sages, and he's going to repeat and answer their questions based on what he heard from his guru, Sukadev, who spoke the Bhagavatam. So the history of the Bhagavatam then comes out in the fourth chapter, and fifth chapter, and sixth chapter, and a little bit in the seventh chapter, and, and there's Vyas and his despondency, and then there's Narada's coming and giving him the remedy to his despondency, which is basically to enter into meditation and ultimately rewrite to a second draft of what was the Bhagavad Purana mm -hmm. that he already written, that then becomes more known by the Goswami's terminology and also in the terminology of the, of the other Puranas as the Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. Um, so, again, the history of the book, and it reaches the point of the sages then asking again that, that okay, it was compiled by Narada, or compiled by Vyas, and so forth, and, and uh, spoke to Sukadev, but why did Sukadev want to hear it? It was already a self-realized soul, but he had a purpose studying a book, and the answer is given, so this book contains it deals with a subject that's post-liberated. Liberated souls would be attracted to. It's very extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And so when they answer, when Sutta Goswami answers like this, then the question comes about Parikshit Marsh. Well, so that's interesting about Sukhya. Tell tells about the Raj and so forth. And so he begins to speak about Parikshit Maharaj. It's like the seventh chapter. I think there are 19, 19 chapters of the first canto. And so, in the course of doing that, and other related topics and tangents come in, you know, in the preceding chapters. And then he begins with telling the story of, of the, um, uh, uh, the chastising of, what is his name, the Brahman Ashvatama who threw the Brahmastra at um, Uttara, in whose womb was Parikshit. Mm -hmm. And so then the whole story of Ashpatam is there, and how Draupadi dealt with it, and so forth and so on, and um, it leads into the, the, the prayers of, of, of Kunti, and, and um, uh, again, the, uh, that to the story of Bhishma, and it, it, it sounds a little disjointed, but it's not the way the, way the book goes. And, and, uh, and then Yudhisthira's lament, hmm? what happened, Kurukshet to war, so many people have died. Uh, I guess that, it, that, that leads to, the, to Bhishma's going to see Bhishma, and then the destructions of Bhishma come, great Mahajana, very extraordinary, and so forth. And then uh, what... Uh, uh, um, the, uh, the story of Parikshit's birth and how he was so powerful that he counteracted time. Hmm? Uh, that's the implication of his chastisement of Kali. Kali's time was there. He stopped him. So what was the, 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 so it's a real, the considerable glorification of Parikshit Maharaj is building up and building up and building up. Hmm? And um, um, Suddenly then, in the later chapters, maybe chapter 18, um, 17, 18, he 
is out in the forest and uh, he comes to a hermitage and he's thirsty and he sees the sage in the hermitage is, is meditating. What's his name? Samika? Samika Rishi. He's meditating, or Richard Marsh th thinks, maybe he's meditating, maybe he's faking. Hmm? I'm thirsty, I'm the king. Hmm? And he doesn't, so he doesn't give me any water or anything, and he even acknowledge me. And so he, I guess he, he killed a snake, and with the tip of his bow, he took the snake and garnered the sage with the snake as a way of showing his displeasure. Now, the point I'm making here, of course, it sounds very, you know, he's, he's ticked off at the guy. <laughs> We're citing him as an example of tolerant. <laughs> he's, he's, kind of, he's kind of upset. But the point I'm making is with this build-up through the chapters, you're supposed to understand he is a very extraordinary person, and something very uncharacteristic of such a person has just occurred. Hmm, what's behind this? So there may be instances in which very exalted devotees do something uncharacteristic. What we have to do is we have to play it out and see what was the result of it. Hmm? You take the Parashara of Muni, and he was a sober sage, and he saw what a fisherman's daughter and lost it, and and had union with her on the riverside, and that's very seems out of character, but then. Vyas was born. Hmm? So, great devotees are moved by Bhagwan in different ways, and sometimes they even do things that may be unbecoming, but we know that they are uh, not arising out of the same consciousness, if you will, that we might do those things. We know that by the extraordinary results that follow. In this case, of course, as we're, we're, we're seeing, Prichard Marsh. Uh, was uh, had disrespected the, the sage. He went away, and they began to think, was he really in a trance, or was he just faking it? And that he had his good qualities again start to show up, and he, he has this introspection about what he did and so forth. And, and meanwhile, the son of the sage, hmm, Stringy, Stringy. He, he gets upset. He says, who does this king think he is? He comes to my to the, to the Brahmin's hermitage of the sage, Arisi, meditating on Brahman. Hmm? It's, a, it's a really nice point that I'll bring out here. Is that he was meditating on Brahman, and Pariksit Maharaj was a Mahabhagavata. Hmm? So... They were, two in, they were two in actually very different positions, and Pariksit Mark's position was extraordinary. Hmm? He was a great devotee. Hmm? And uh, in service to them, in any small way, is better to be involved in than entering into Brahman. Hmm? Because it creates a prospect for you. Shri Marsh gave the example. Someone may be the CEO of a 10-story building and living on the 10th story penthouse in the penthouse suite. Another person in the building next door, which is 100 stories, may be a doorkeeper. So their positions are very different. Hmm? And um, so the man may drive by the 100-story building, see the doorkeeper, and think, there's the doorkeeper. And he goes to his building, goes up to his suite, or from his 10th floor, he can look down sometimes and see the doorkeeper in the other building, <laughs> thinking, I was in the street like that once. Here I am on the 10th story now, just see my position and so forth. But the point is what? That the position of the doorkeeper is better. Why? Because he is working for at a hundred story building and when he he has the prospect of working his way up and making the tenth story CEO look like a doorkeeper hmm? as he looks down 90 stories at that guy right there. 
this is just an example, but by connection with bhakti, we have a much higher prospect. And bhakti is all about, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. And of course, you know the right person to tell you you should know something also. But this is the thing really to know. It's, it's that there are people worth knowing and serving and associating with and keeping that association. In bhakti, we advance by sangha, not by detachment. And our knowledge that we, we gather is only as good as we use it, as I often say, to soften our heart and engage in service. So it's a different way of arriving at, at, at knowing and progressing and so forth. So Pritchard Marsh's position was was super extraordinary. Not that not that that not that devotees will therefore mistreat from and realize persons. Of course, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did that to some extent when he was young and naughty, and he'd go on the banks of the the Ganges and bathe with his student friends, and then he'd see the meditators and he splash water on them and disturb their meditation and say, I'm the object of your meditation, standing before you, like this. <laughs> but we are respectful to all this, the sadhus. So it's not that I'm saying Pritchard Marsh had every right to be garlanded with a snake like this, but something larger, some larger event was being orchestrated through Parikshit Maharaj by Krishna. And of course it's ultimately the, the, the speaking of the Bhagavatam. So anyway, he, 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 as he left there, son of the sage became upset and said, who does the king think he is? The, what, has, what, has, what, what has happened in Kali Yuga? Hmm? Here it is, the beginning, and the kings think that they should be respected more than the Brahmins, and they disrespect the Brahmins and the sages. Hmm? What will become of the world? Of course, Prabhupada put a different twist on it. He said, here's the Kali Yuga, the beginning of the degradation of the Brahmins. Hmm? In the form of a Brahmin boy, didn't know better, and what did he do? He cursed the king to die in seven days from um, the bite of the snake bird. I'm not sure what that is. Snake, the snake bird. Therefore, it's a snake bird or whatever magical thing, whatever. But um, when his father heard this, he was upset. So he could understand the king was, was an extraordinary devotee. And, and so if a great devotee does something that someone out of character at times, we have to overlook that in light of their standing and devotion. Who knows what the reason behind it is, and so on and so forth. Hmm? We have to analyze what is the measure of their faith, try to see the measure of their, their enthusiasm for hearing, chanting, preaching, living in holy places, creating holy places, and so on and so forth. All these things. Um, someone quoted me, um, on the internet, and it's not something I said, but I've said something like it. He said that, I heard that Swami Tripurari has said, don't tell me what you believe, tell me how you spend your money. Hmm? No, it's not a bad thing. I said, I don't want to know what you believe, I want to know what you do. Hmm? Anybody could say, I believe this or that or the other thing. So, you didn't get quite, a, quite right, but, it, but it's the same principle, because you can say, I believe this, that, but how you spend your money is money is meant to be spent. So how you spend it is really what you believe in, where your faith is and what you're all about. Hmm? Right? Side point there. What was my point? Mm -hmm. So... Raj, the degradation of the Brahmanas and the degradation of Kali Yuga. And the judgment of people based on a circumstance that we may not really right. understand. Right, right, right. <clears throat> yeah, so we should judge people by how they use their money. <laughs> what they, we're going to say what they believe in by that is my point. Uh, so, at any rate, he did something that was out of character, Shelley's whole picture of them, him them then be uh, based on that or based on the greater balance of his life and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so, 
the son, anyway, cursed him, and the father was upset that, you know, you made a big mistake, he's a great devotee, better, better, uh, great, great soul, and you've cursed him over a small thing, hmm? over a small thing. Hmm? So how the sage took it. He came to my ashram, I was in a trance, he was thirsty, and he got real agitated. It's just a small thing, and you've cursed him. So Prabhupada looked at this as, oh, the degradation of the Brahmins is the characteristic of, of Kali Yuga. I think that's the way he wrote about it. The son was saying, the degradation of the Chatriyas, you see, the Kali Yuga, they don't know how to honor the Brahmins. Hmm? But his own father said, oh, no, you're wrong, what you've done. Hmm? Um, uh, the king's, of course, position is glorious in one sense, but in another sense, not so at all. And more so, um, it is, uh, is the emphasis of the Bhagavatam. The position of the king is worldly. Hmm? And uh, Pritchard Marj himself would say, later in the, in the 19th chapter that I'm blessed, here I am. He took the curse as a blessing, but he went to the bank of the Ganges, got association of sadhus, and so on and so forth, which is ordinarily not something that kings get to have. They're not really kind of welcome at, at the ashrams, because the ashrams are not about worldliness, and kings are all about worldliness. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would not entertain the idea of having uh, giving the darshan to the king. He thought to Prudra Maharaj in, in Puri, because he thought, well, if, if, if I'm seen with a the king, means worldliness. He's got everything. The man who has everything, the harem and whatnot. So. I'm a sage, a sadhu, a sannyasi, because these are the opposite ends of the spectrum. There's many stories in the Bhagavatam of kings and so forth. You're making this point again and again and again. What is worldliness hmm? in great measure for that matter? Hmm? When it is at the cost, to use a biblical kind of saying, at the cost of one's own, knowing one's own soul, hmm? all the wealth one can acquire. These are simple points that are brought out in the stories, and people like the stories to tell them, and they never even get the point sometimes. And they don't, again, and again, they're very simple points, but they're very profound points. Hmm? But if you put the, these simple points that you can get intellectually, although people read sometimes and they don't even get the, that's what's really being said here. They're contrasting many of the stories of the king's worldliness with spiritual life. Uh, they don't go material acquisition and spiritual life don't go well together. Hmm. But if you get the point, put it in place in your life, then it's huge. Hmm. So, kings typically were personified worldly, worldliness. So, the, the, the king later on, Raj, he speaks about himself. Oh, he's so introspective. Hmm. He's so introspective. He's so. Um, willing to find fault in himself hmm, rather than in others. All this, again, he had all these good characteristics before this, this one of them, and then after how he responds to it is extraordinary. And how he responds to it, of course, is, is the discussion tonight. Hmm? He was cursed by the son. The Brahmin's, the son's father was upset with the boy, chastised him, and then thought, oh, this, is, this would be terrible if this would happen. He was such a saintly king. He was a saint at the same time. And what will happen to all those that is, he made this guy interfered with Kali Yuga, staved off Kali Yuga. Again, he could stop time. Hmm. This is Maharaj Purchit. He could stop time. And the point is, he was cursed to die in seven days. We already know that he could stop time. Hmm. Hmm. So he had the power to stop the curse. We already know that. In seven days you will die. He had the power to turn into 70 yugas if he wanted to. He could play with time like this. Stop Kali Yuga. Although he gave him some room. Hmm? He said Kali could not proceed in the presence of Maharaj Parikshit. Kali is, is a reference to time. Hmm? 
And so here he has a certain time, he's cursed, and he could have stopped it is the point. But he didn't. He took it as a blessing. So this is a high form of tolerance. We find Mahaprabhu Chaitanya Dev speaking about tolerance in the stage of Nishta. Hmm? He says, like a tree, we should be tolerant. That stands and tolerates the, the, you know, the elements, the heat, the cold, the rain, gives shelter to others at the same time. That's taking the example further. There are two types of tolerance. Tolerance in the Gita and tolerance in the Bhagavatam. The Gita speaks of Matrasparshas to Kuntaya Sitoshna Sukutukada. Agamapayano Nityasatam Sikshashvabhavata. The fruit of which is liberation, the next verse says. One who can tolerate heat, cold, happiness, distress, good and bad, all of which arise from the senses and the mind and aren't a true reading of the nature of reality because for you it's hot for me it's cold for you it's bad for me it's good it's all relative to the goggles that we're wearing what color glasses you have hmm? so one can see through that it becomes air to to liberation becomes free from from the senses because those are the readings that we're following hmm? and um, making our our personality is going to be made out of that. This is good, this is bad, this is happy, this is sad. Hmm? So to undo all that is to is to undo the, the knot, the world knot, as Schopenhauer called it. The world knot. Hmm? Ankar. Hmm? False identity. So this is a kind of a stoic tolerance of course I often say that this this tolerance has to be combined with the idea that's emphasized in the Goswami's teachings in Gaudiya Vedanta and Gaudiya Vaishnavism that you need to find a favorable place for your spiritual culture you need to come to Saragrahi <laughs> you don't have to stay somewhere else where there are criticisms of your teacher or you know, all kinds of unfavorable things. So, uh, we create a, so then, then in the context of the favorable environment, we'll tolerate others. We're there for the same reason, but there we have some, some clashing of personalities. And whatever, there's always going to be things to tolerate. You don't have to look, go look for tolerance. A couple of my brothers have told me, you know, you should come back to such and such institution because then you, you know, you would have, it would, be, it would be a good opportunity for you to tolerate. I said, I don't need to look for tolerance. I got to tolerate you guys from a distance. You know. <laughs> and there are other things to tolerate. And I think it's the, the calling and the teaching is go look for tolerate, things to tolerate. Tolerate the things that come in the context of a favorable um, environment. And that they were, our environment is not favorable, then we talk about it and we try to adjust it. Hmm? And, and, and there may be difficulties even in a favorable environment, which is sort of some uh, kind of the teaching we're, we're giving in our group, for example. Hmm? So, so at any rate, this, this kind of tolerance of the Gita is important. Then the Bhagavatam speaks of another level of tolerance. So it says, Tatteinu kampam susamikshamana mudane vatmapitam vipakam vidvagvapu virhiram namaste jiveta yamuti pare sadaya bhak. And in the language of Sridhar Maharaj, in the poetic rendering of it, what did he say? The environment, the environment is friendly. friendly. So this is what we see here in, in Raj Pariksit. This kind of tolerance can, can start to come theoretically at any time, but really be in practice in Asati, and ultimately it's a characteristic of Bhava. Wherein, so it can't be imitated. 